All right, so I'm Rich Bruckner from Inside HPC. I write about high performance computing for a living. And I don't know why they picked me for this, but I was told there would be no math. So don't worry. Uh, I'm a journalist. Uh, t yeah, Tom's going to, he's going to ask me something. I'm sure he is. Okay. So today the topic is code modernization, right? And we've got people here that are experts in this, in their, in, in their mission of supercomputing. And I'm just going to have them each introduce themselves and go down the line. Tell us who you are and what you do and what your mission is. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Rich. My name is Samir Shende. I serve as the director of the Performance Research Lab at the University of Oregon and president of Paratools Inc. and Paratools SAS. I work on the Tau Performance System. It's a profiling and tracing toolkit and it can help you analyze the performance of your codes. It's uh, available for download with a BSD style license. Thank you. My name is uh, Aaron Knoll. I'm a research scientist at the Scientific Computing and Imaging Institute at the University of Utah. I do a lot of work in large-scale visualization, especially ray tracing for visualization. I collaborate a lot with um, the Intel TCG group uh, with uh, Jim Jefferson and Gowald, uh, and we uh, conduct new research that lets us tackle some of the largest problems at scale, and we need efficient code on CPU and Xeon Pi for this. Um, hi, my name is Richard Gerber. I'm the uh, user services group lead at NERSC at Berkeley Lab. And I lead a group um, that is working to try to help scientists um, improve the performance of their applications as we move to, to many core architectures. OK, you pass the mic down. I'm uh, Chris Sewell from Los Alamos. I work on the data science at scale team. And we're interested, in particular, in visualization and analysis for large scale data. Also work a little bit on physics codes, but but mainly in visualization and analysis, and am part of the uh, BTKM project, which is uh, kind of modernizing the the visualization toolkit uh, from Kitware, uh, along with people from other labs uh, for for these new multi-core, mini-core architectures. Okay, Tom. My name is Tom Murphy. I teach at a community college eight miles north of UC Berkeley. Yeah. Uh, my and I'm, during the summers, I will teach faculty how to do. Uh, parallel and distributed computing, so that can ripple down to their students. Uh, my passion is high performance computing education, particularly to marginalized people, which is a code name for women and people of color. Hi, I'm Dave DeMarl. I work at Kitware on the Visualization Toolkit and Pair Review, and we're under a uh, big. Oh, hold it up right a little higher. Project. Thanks. Hey. So, so I work on uh, the Visualization Toolkit and Pair Review, and we're under a big effort right now to modernize VTK and Pair Review. Uh, to go beyond the pure distributed memory shared parallelism work and, and generally modernize the code right now. Okay, okay. Um, well, my first question is for Richard Gerber, so let's get him a mic, please. Richard, from your experience, what are the top three considerations when you're trying to optimize for many core for your optimization? The top three. Do you have a top three? Yeah, we, we have <laughs> developed a top three. I'll give you a little bit of background first. Yeah. We, we have this. Um, program we call NESAP. That's the NERSC Exascale Sci um, Scientific Application Program. And we have um, a big uh, number of users and, and, and projects at NERSC at Berkeley. And we've identified some of the top codes that run on our systems uh, across a, a large number of um, application areas. And we started a program to work with them because next year we are getting um, a system called Cori. And Cori will have about 9,000 nodes of Intel Phi Knight's Landing processors. Right. So our users know this is coming, and they have told us very emphatically that they need help getting ready for that machine. So we, we started NESAP, and we've been working with uh, these teams for about a year now, and with Cray and in, a lot of help from Cray and Intel, and we've had a lot of success. So we've been thinking about moving from um, this fat core architecture. Um, we have a machine called Edison now that is a, an Intel Ivy Bridge based system that has, is very fast, has a lot of memory. They love this machine, but now we're going to a different type of architecture. So we've been working with them to try to optimize their codes. And we've, we've conceptually decided that w the way to attack this is to worry about three things. One is vectorization optimization, so there's additional parallelism with, with uh, the new wide vector units. Another is to, now you have to worry a lot about 
data. There's a data movement and data reuse, and it's something they hadn't really thought about as much before. So that's another thing. And then there's a lot of thread level parallelism that they have to take advantage of on, on a chip that has 60 um, actual hardware cores and maybe 120 threads running around in these cores and that sort of thing. So w w we've already seen some improvements just running on x86 um, of a couple of times just from refactoring codes. But one question I, I do have for the rest of the panel is, is this a good way to think about going about optimizing codes? And if so, where do you start? What's the first, is, is there an order? Is there a way to approach it? Someone have a comment? Aaron, good, good. Uh, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll take that. Uh, and I would say absolutely yes. That's uh, a very good way of looking at it, especially in that order, would be to start with vectorization first. Um, and uh, then look at uh, data structure, uh, sort of memory movement. In a sense, uh, data structure is sort of part of vectorization, the sort of structure of arrays and a, uh, array of structures question. Um, so yeah, vectorization first, then memory, um, then uh, uh, then moving forward to, uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, it, the threads and then um, MPI after that. Uh, I'd say in the past, uh, the, the question is how do you do this more generally? And I think uh, we're moving towards open MPE solutions in the future that will enable us to do this much uh, in a more straightforward way. Okay, Tom. So I, I absolutely agree with both of you. I, I think it's well worth going through a structured way of going through it. But what I've realized is there's also an art to what we do. So after we've gone through and done all that, sometimes we have to go back and reconsider other things that we learned in the process of going through it rigorously. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, it, I think um, you know, that's what, in a sense, what the profiling tools are useful for, is you can actually see how, how good your first pass is and, and take it from there. Yeah, because I had a canned question here for you, Aaron. It's, how has the, the way you go about vectorizing, the vectorization, how has that changed? How do you get it done now? Yeah, so it d definitely if I went back four years ago and uh, during my PhD research, uh, back when I was working in low-level uh, SSE code, uh, I would uh, code. I would determine the data layout first, then code and intrinsics for that, then um, so, so follow the path that uh, Richard described uh, in essence, and I would do this all manually. And uh, over the years, we had sort of internal projects at Intel, um, for, for example, ISPC, that we would use. And we still use them, uh, by and large, uh, for example, in the Osprey Ray Tracer. But I think moving forward, we have even better approaches to that, uh, such as OpenMP, that will you know, really generalize this and really allow us to uh, get vectorization, uh, use uh, data layout more or less automatically, but do the right things and have the compiler take care of it. Um, now the question is, uh, how do you achieve that and still have low-level control and use the performance analysis tools in the right way? And I, I think we, we can we can do this. Okay. Okay, David. I think you had a comment on um, this. So I was just going to take the counter example. So um, you were you were um, advocating for working on vectorization first and then add, you know work to different ways. Um, I would argue that why not just take it structurally down from from distributed memory to threads and then to vectorization. Um, what's wrong with that approach? Uh, I would say there's nothing wrong with it as long as you're um, aware that you have to do the vectorization or, or at least factor in for vectorization at some point. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, you're, you really want to use structure of array layout for what goes into your registers. And if you uh, do that first, then your life will be very easy. And if you don't, then it will be a lot harder. Uh, OK. And just to add one other thing, there's the notion of good enough. You know, because Knuth said in his Turing Award that premature optimization is the death of all coding. So sometimes if it's good enough, we might not have to go to vectorization. We might not have to worry about data motion. And that's a good thing to weave in, especially when you're teaching students, which is what I do. Yeah, that, that's absolutely fair. And that's where the I think the OpenMP solutions um, especially or could be very powerful. Uh, Okay, I want to change topics a little bit here. This question is for Chris. Uh, you know, you're, you're a data scientist at Los Alamos, and how does that tie in with visualization? I'm, I'm having trouble connecting the dots with this multi-core, many-core, and all this going on. Right, well, so there's kind of two aspects to visualization. One is going from your raw data to 
a set of geometric primitives, and then the second is rendering those primitives to the screen. So for example, if you start with a, a grid that has some field values defined at each point, and then you want to say create an ISO surface of that. So that would be the first step is computing that ISO surface, and then the second step would be um, then rendering those triangles that result from the ISO surface algorithm as pixels on the screen. Um, and, and so both of those have a lot of challenges with, with uh, large data and with, uh, with the new, new architectures and how to take advantage of those. So on the, um, on the rendering side of things, Intel has, has uh, taken the lead a lot in this, uh, in their Osprey and their uh, OpenSWIR uh, visualization platforms. So Osprey is, is a ray tracer um, and you know, traditionally a lot of movie uh, quality visualization has been done with ray tracers on CPUs. And so now they're kind of trying to bring that into real-time scientific visualization. Um, but then for your more traditional rasterizers like you do with OpenGL, traditionally on a GPU or potentially using something like Mesa for, for software rasterizing, you know, we've done that in the past, but it's often very slow on CPUs compared to GPUs. And so this open swir uh, is, is really, uh, speeding that up so that you can get uh, high quality performance uh, for for rendering your geometric primitives on using a CPU uh, multi-core based system like the Phi, and, and so uh, then on the other on the other side of it though the the first part of that pipeline where you are uh, generating the uh, the initial the primitives from your raw data the filters like isosurface or streamlines and all. That's where the uh, the community, and, and in particular, at least within my experience, the, the DOE community, along with companies like Kitware, has uh, kind of been taking the lead in in modernizing the, the visualization toolkit code, which is widely used in, in scientific computing, and it's the basis for tools like Paraview and Visit. Um, and so having that run um, and, and take advantage of these architectures is something that, that we've been working on for a, for a few years. We started at Los Alamos with something called the Piston Project for using uh, a lot of these data parallel primitives, we call them, to, to express our algorithms and then optimize the back ends for those primitives um, for, for these new architectures. Um, and so now we've kind of coalesced with, with other efforts at, at Sandia and Oak Ridge and Kitware and, and are working on the, the VTKM project. Okay. Okay, someone have a comment on that? Yeah, and Dave. Would, and I would just like to say that if uh, we had taken Aaron's approach and thought um, at the time that take into account um, at least threading and vectorization and also advanced, you know, how actually to store the data a long time ago, it would have made all this transition a lot easier. So if we had thought about it in depth at the time, it would have been better. But that, that being said, VTK is about 20 years old now. And at the time, there was there weren't that many threaded machines around, oh, and, and vectorized yeah. machines had just come out of fashion at the time. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, S Samir, we haven't given you a chance to talk here, but I, I wanted to ask you about performance evaluation tools and and, and, and optimization tools. So, uh, and by the way, what happened to the Ducks, the, the, the football <laughs> team? What is the deal? I'm from Oregon, by the way. So. Oh, good to hear that. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure they'll improve their game. Okay. <laughs> so, uh. I work on the Tau Performance Tools project, and uh, Tau is a technology that's very relevant to the discussion going on here. Uh, many times, developers don't know where their application is spending its time or what it's doing. They don't know how well it vectorizes. They have turned on the compiler directives, but they need to know exactly how well it is doing at which loops. So with Tau, you can automatically instrument your source code. You can identify the loops that take the most time. And using hardware performance counters from Pappy, you can measure exactly how well the vectorization is working. For instance, you know we know about the AVX512 instructions and the 512-bit wide registers. Yeah. Now, if I can fit eight of those doubles in one instruction, I want to know if I can have eight doubles in one instruction, how close is this loop to hitting that peak limit of eight? Is it at 3.5? Is it at four? People don't know that. So with Tau, you can sort the loops based on how much time they take and see precisely what is the ratio of the elements that are, you know, the number of elements that are active to the total number of instructions and calculate those 
ratios, you can see exactly how much memory your application is using, what is the rate of I.O. You can pretty much take an X-ray of your whole application and find out what it's doing, when it's doing. Okay. Is this open source? It is Tau? open source. Yeah. It's okay. available with a BST style license. You can download it from tau.uoregon.edu. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so how how were they getting this done without before Tau came along? I mean, were this so, just not happening or what? So many times they put in you know get time of day statements in their code around loops and then say okay this loop is taking <laughs> so long and then they turn on some some pragmas. They may turn on like a pound pragma simd and try to force the vectorization which may not be the best way to go about it. And so yeah. th there's a lot of trial and error and manual instrumentation and do it yourself kind of approaches. There are some excellent tools out there and I would encourage all the developers to consider using a tool, any tool, to help you go towards uh, that goal of optimizing your application effectively. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I'm going to pick on Tom because we have history. <laughs> you know, back when he used to date uh, Ada Lovelace in college, uh, did, you know, yeah. how were they getting this done back then? I mean, uh, what? Well, Rich, when I was a child, <laughs> yeah. I worked for Control Data. Uh -huh. And as a supercomputer company, I figured every cycle was precious. And I had to make sure every cycle got used well. And at one point, I got hit between the eyes with the fact that if I worried about data motion, you know, getting stuff to and from disk and memory, because that was so much slower than the CPU, it made a difference in the overall performance. And so that just blew me away. And throughout my career, I've kept aware of data motion. And the time we're in right now, I think it's getting more and more important. We're getting stranger, I mean, more marvelous and marvelous architectures, right? <laughs> CPU speed is improving rapidly. I.O. is not improving as well, so through the years there's been a wider and wider gap. Yeah. I think data motion is always something to keep your eye on if you're going for performance. <laughs> performance. <laughs> All right. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, 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 it does, right? You know, with the old, with, what's the old, it's uh, moving data is a sin in the HPC space, right? And. Uh, I wanted to guy. I know you're. This is a software panel, but I want to ask about the new hardware with all these memory hierarchies, right? Is that going to introduce just all kinds of more complexity in in your day jobs that you're aware? I mean, is it going to make it harder? So actually, I, I think that's where good enough comes in. Yeah. I, ideally, our architecture is going to keep changing. You betcha. They've yeah. been doing that since I was a kid, right? So if you can make code that's good enough and that still resembles code and is not too locked in there's a chance you may be able to move it from architecture to architecture. It was easy to do that when everything was single CPU, single memory. Yeah. It's not quite so easy anymore. Yeah. And if there's lots of different levels of memory, you have to be very careful about where does it reside, how do you amortize the, the motion. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the answer is yes and yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the memory hierarchy all the way from, from disk um, all the way to the, to the registers is becoming more and more complicated. Um, but but the chip designers don't do it just to make our lives difficult, right? <laughs> so presumably they're introducing some some new features and and um, some new performance that we can we can um, try to take advantage of. So that's really everybody's challenge is to, is to, in the one hand, make it so that you say good enough. But I think what you mean by that is really what counts is is productivity time from from when you have an idea for something till you can actually implement it and run it and that sort of thing. But at the same time, take advantage of, of the new capabilities that are in these chips, right? So, you know, you, you, there's new vectorization, um, which is great, and, and maybe it's hard to, to write your code to take advantage of it, but it's very hard to leave a factor of eight or 16 or whatever just on the table without doing that. So, so it's, you, you, you really want to try to, to take advantage of these features if you can, but yes, it's, it's hard, and yeah. it'll keep us all employed for a while at yeah. least. Yeah, for sure. Do you have a comment? Dave? Yeah, so I was just saying that, I was just thinking that there's um, some new research out there in things like the Legion project and others where the, the overall strategy for not moving the data is to actually move the code and to do things like scheduling the execution of the code so that it runs wherever the data needs to be and moving things like that. So those are research projects, but they, they definitely, um, I think they will likely bear fruit and hopefully make all of our jobs as programmers easier um, and still allow us to get performance out of out of out of these really extreme, yeah. complicated systems. Yep, yep. 
Have any of you looked at Legion? Um, yeah, so we're working with uh, Stanford University on, on parts of uh, VTK integration with it. Um, and so I've looked at it briefly. It looks uh, very clever, um, much more clever than my coding skills are. <laughs> um, but uh, they're able to produce, to, um, they're also, at the time they're making it, they're also thinking about um, what are the higher level abstractions, higher level programming languages we can build, build out of it. So it's definitely it's this research project right now, but it's it's it, the concept is I think is very good and for this next generation of things and the the deeper memory hierarchy especially. In fact, I, I'm going to a uh, meeting in two weeks, uh, a boot camp for Legion to to learn about, and uh, yeah, there's lots of interest in that at, at Los Alamos right now. Okay, any other questions from the audience? I don't want to monopolize this discussion. You got the. I'm sorry. Is there anything else like Legion, or is that pretty much they pretty much own that space right now? Bproc. Bproc. Okay. There, there's also Uinta from from Utah, which is a little different, but it's kind of vaguely in that same space. I think a little more specific for a particular domain, but. I think of you know Legion as more or less a in a sense a programming model like a DSL and um, you know Uinta is really a, a full framework. It's really tailored towards HPC, um, and then you have things that are even more in the along the programming model path <coughs> that are things we'd really like to see make them make their way into the mainline languages. Um, but I think that the common thread here is that you do have to take advantage of vectorization and you do have to achieve latency hiding uh, at a mass scale for all the various levels of hierarchy you have. And that's, you know, regardless of what you're using underneath the hood and what your code looks like and what the best way to express that is, that's, that's sort of the common thread to how to modernize code. Yeah. Uh, I would like to add that uh, levels of memory hierarchy are not going away. We have to live with them, but more importantly, we need to understand how your application is doing to utilize that. With tools, you can see and actually measure precisely at the routine and the loop level what was the number of level one data cache misses, the number of data level two da data cache misses. And it's important to understand the architecture of your processor. For instance, even if you have a single socket, do you have multiple memory uh, domains, NUMA domains? How is the memory controller or the physical memory chips connected to your socket? When you do a memory allocation, are you getting memory that is tied to a processor on the other side of the chip? And what is the ratio of local references to the total references that you may have? Are NUMA effects playing a part? Because the cost of accessing DRAM locally to a to a processor may be very different from accessing DRAM that's connected to a different processor in a different domain connected by the QPI links through two separate you know, NUMA domains. So tools such as Tau can expose that information at the cache and the main memory level and it can point out exactly for which region of code what was the ratio of the local to total accesses. And I'm a teacher, so I, NUMA is non-uniform memory architecture. And I do think that is another architecture that we're going to be playing with in the future, more and more. And I, I definitely think we've stumbled upon the elephant in the room is the memory hierarchy effects. Because um, in ideal situations, you're never going to get better than linear speed up just by using the CPUs. But taking it into things like the cache, cache effects, yeah. you can do much better. And then the other aspect is re rewriting your algorithms. It's, you can do even better. Yeah, if, um, uh, just a shameless plug for uh, the Intel booth. If you want to see an extreme NUMA system, I have a three terabyte, terabyte of memory uh, Brooklyn DX platform workstation over at the uh, Utah booth uh, for people to come take a look at. And yeah, these are definitely things we are going to have to worry about a lot more um, in now, actually. Uh, maybe not optimizing individual pieces of code for individual workstations or nodes of a specific HPC resource, but at least being aware that um, that a cache miss has a big penalty, especially when you go all the way to disk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I have one more general question, and it's what are we missing? I mean, I think we addressed a number of things, but what, what haven't we talked about here that's so important? Uh, Rich, we're, we're missing everything. <laughs> well, and, and that's, I can, Wait. so I, I just hit yeah. 64. Yeah. That has been the fun since I was 16, that there's always new stuff to play with, yeah. and we can never nail it perfectly. And that's, that's part of the fun. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, I got a topic I want to just switch here. It's about young people, and uh, you know, a couple of you work at universities, of course, but 
are you having trouble getting you know young people that to, to fill the jobs that need to be done and what can we do about that in your opinion any, any thoughts there and who's having troubles yeah if you if you know any talented developer you know young young people will take them yeah we're always hiring <laughs> yeah but it's hard like i teach with marginalized students they often tank their GPA because they haven't learned how to be a student. By the time they learn how to be a student, be good problem solvers, they might have a sub 2.0 GPA. And like at Intel, hard to get hired because they focus on GPA. My son's at Apple. Apple throws away the, uh, the transcript and just talks to the person. There's different cultures, right? Yeah. But it is an art form to link with a student and to con them, uh, convince them um, on the things that they need to do to, yeah, yeah. you know, to get it done. I mean, do I, they teach parallel programming undergraduate? Yes. Do they? Do they? Okay. Well, 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 I, 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 I'm, yeah. I'm asking. Yeah. I, 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 I teach currently, and actually, I think probably a lot of us have <clears throat> on this panel, but <clears throat> one of the other challenges is that um, at this day and age, I, I would say higher level programming um, uh, models are uh, increasingly popular. They're increasingly taught, and a lot of my students uh, want to learn JavaScript <laughs> and uh, or want to want to use Python. And um, we lack the tools currently in languages such as those to express the um, I wouldn't even say low level parallelism, but any parallelism uh, that we we have in uh, techniques such as SIMD intrinsics. Um, and, uh, and that's, that's a, a challenge. But getting people excited, I think, is the other part of it. The, I think that's, in a sense, the bigger part of it. Uh, I mean, I think about um, you know, where a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, my colleagues got their start. They were interested in programming games and doing whatever uh, it took to make those fast and cool. And now, um, you know, people who do that, they're programming games uh, on handheld devices using very, very simple uh, programming models compared to what we do in HPC. And I think making that connection, getting people excited about HPC, about um, you know, Intel architectures and, and other architectures, but especially for this panel, Intel architectures, uh, that's, um, I think that's, uh, that's what, something we should really focus on. There's a bit of a conflict and maybe also convergence in, in big data. You know, I say I'm on the data science and scale team. And so for, for most people, big data, you know, the cloud, you know, running things on Amazon Web Services, you know, doing Hadoop and, and uh, uh, MapReduce, et cetera. And so that's a bit different than the big data in the HPC space, although there's also opportunities for uh, the HPC space to, to leverage a lot of what's going on there. And so um, I guess on one side, there's, there's effort in our team and, and elsewhere to, to see how maybe these aren't really that different and how we can leverage a lot of that technology in HPC in ways that we hadn't thought about before. But also on the other side, from the student side, you know, there's not a whole lot of students learning um, HPC and big data and from that, from, from our side of the world. And so it is hard to, to find people who, who aren't just doing you know, MapReduce for search or something. So, boy, so, oh, uh, so, so let me answer you and say that I, I'm very optimistic, actually. Um, I guess I've been in, in this field long enough, as you have too, that I know that, that it's, it, it's maybe slow and maybe we're still kind of a, a niche, but um, HPC is much more mainstream than it used to be, right? Um, nobody was taught parallel programming or HPC or anything like that, you know, when I started. Um, and now, you know, there are, there are parallel programming languages and, and things, and... Um, you know, you teach at a community college, there's a community college near me, and um, we recently had them come for a tour, and they had, a, they had formed a STEM club, and I went out and gave them a talk, and they were just so excited about the, 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 the idea, um, the science, you know, I'm, I'm also um, the senior science advisor at NERSC, and you show them you know, the climate simulations or other things that impact the, the energy, the environment, making better devices, making better um, solar cells or uh, carbon sequestration. This, they just get so excited and, they, and seeing that H computing is part of this and HPC, they just, they, they're, they're, they're like, I want an internship. How can I get an internship? How can I do this? And, um, and so, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm really optimistic. You know, I, I also hire people to help people with their codes and more and more and more we're seeing people that really have a great background in this and they're just excited about doing it and so so I'm, I'm very optimistic I know there are still many 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 challenges but I'm also very optimistic too that's encouraging so um, 
changing gears here just a little bit, there was a published rant about somebody in the supercomputing business about old code and that we shouldn't <laughs> be spending money on exascale machines. We've got all these codes that were pretty mediocre in the first place that are 20 years old. They're still in production use at places like the labs. That's where the investment should be. And uh, what are your thoughts there, Tom? So being old. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So when you're in industry and you have those codes around, yeah. the rules are as a developer, if you touch it, you own it. So what happens is <laughs> you basically have Frankenstein code. There's parts that no one understands and they'll add another layer around it to solve some problem. So, and it's the investment to go and do it again from scratch is high. Now some companies end up being brilliant in doing that. Uh, like Martin Watt at DreamWorks completely redid the code from scratch using TBB mm -hmm. and he basically enabled uh, How to Train Your Dragon 1 and 2 to take place because an animator could uh, rig up something and immediately see it move rather than wait two minutes. So waiting two minutes to see what happened kind of kills creativity. Seeing it instantly works. Yeah. Great film, by the way. I like both of them. Yeah. So, I, so, so, I, so I don't necessarily want to make a value judgment on whether the code is good or bad, but, but um, I'll point out that, that we may be in a, a time that gives us a lot of opportunity. So people change codes when they're forced to. Right. Yeah. So when we went from the, the old vector machines to the, the distributed memory machines, there were a lot of codes. Again, there was a lot of old codes, but a lot of codes that just didn't make it. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so some were weeded out and forces people to rewrite their codes and, and build new codes, improve codes. And so I'm not sure if we're exactly as quite a disruptive technology, but going to the, the low power many core architectures, it, it, we see it happening again. Right. So talking about some people will try to take existing codes, refactor them, move, re reorder the arrays, and do vectorization. But at some point, it's just like, well, this is just too hard. Let's start over and do something new. So I, I, we may be in that era now as well. You're, you're dead on right, because <laughs> if there's an old code that runs in a single core, and we're now at a point where we have millions of cores, and that code runs, the person responsible for that system is not going to be happy with the person who owns that code, because <laughs> most of the computer's idle. And, and I yes. would, say that uh, you know the, there is a wide variety there are a wide variety of different architectures out there and the mainline Xeons are by and large excellent at tackling older code bases that don't fully leverage vectorization can't run you know 32 cores at one gigahertz or something like that yeah. um, on, but on the other hand for the codes that can and, and not just new uh, re-implementations of old uh, theory but brand new theory that is really designed to take advantage of this I mean that's that's really the evolution of not just code but science. I, I think performance engineering is a very important aspect. I think uh, when you move to a new architecture or a new machine, you must understand where your application is spending its time, what it's doing, and how well it is using the underlying architecture. And uh, it's surprising to see how many people don't use tools at all when they do the sport of old legacy code. And I think uh, they need to look at tools to help them in this process. This sounds like driving blind, right? Yes, yeah. really. You just compile it and just hope for the best performance. And when you actually measure it, you'll be surprised to see how poorly it is performing and how it's not utilizing the, the features of the, the chip at all. And I would just like to point out that not all old codes should be thrown away. Um, <laughs> um, even if the old codes are, are useful and there's a community around them and active development, then of course it's time to update. Um, as like we've been doing recently, largely with uh, the help of the NIH maintenance grant for the updating BTK, of BTK's rendering. Um, but yeah, definitely I agree that as with these fairly complicated codes, um, it's not possible to just understand them from a priori without having deep experience, but yes, we definitely want to have um, the introspection of the runtime to, to direct you into what needs to be done. Yeah, yeah, I just should uh, couch that by saying I was not thinking of VTK here at all. I was actually thinking more of scientific codes. Uh, yeah, I think VTK has a lot of opportunities, uh, both VTK and VTKM. In, in some sense, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Uh, you know, 30 years ago, vectorization was critical, and then it kind of became less important, and now it's becoming important again. And I see, uh, you know, some, some older uh, scientists, you know, when we say, oh, we've got to vectorize the code, they're like, ah, yeah, I know how to do that. Yeah. 
All right, guys, we're just about out of time. And any closing thoughts? I know, Tom, you've always got something to leave us with, right? No? No. No, not this time. Uh, well, I, I can tell you, this group of people yeah. has given a good perspective on where we're headed, right? Yeah. And I, I, I think a key thing is, like you were saying with the old code, if you have a computer company that has a good compiler, a lot of times they can do a whole bunch for an old code underneath the hood. And that's also a very promising thing. All right, guys. Well, hey, uh, I think you did a terrific job. Let's give these folks a hand. Great panel today. Thank you, Rick. We'll see you in Salt Lake.